You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. You've written the Charter for Excellence, a declaration of interdependence. If it is understood and felt that we are an organization with integrity and of high ethical standards, it gets transmitted from one staff person to another. There is this special responsibility that's associated with the umbrella of the federal courts. And there's a special requirement for public service and for seeking fairness and justice. But there is a tremendous need for an identity as a system. And the Charter for Excellence will go a long way towards articulating what, the, what our values are and who we want to be and uh, will, will take us to the next level. When you know who you are and what you're trying to achieve, what your goals are, it helps you to do a better job. You can't help but do a better job if you have that strong sense of identity. Uh, he might be a good candidate for the HIP program. Tell me about the process. Did they just send you a letter of rejection? As part of the national judiciary, I think that we have to remember that our mission um, is a common one. Uh, that is the fair administration of justice. So there's more incentive for them to support each other and remain in the United States. I need to verify address at 5043 Woodhaven. In the office, do you have your paycheck stubs? Yes, I do. People bring knowledge, skills, and abilities, and those are very, very important. But what is their character? What are the values that they have? Are they honest? Are they impartial? Are they tolerant? Do they respect uh, divergent views? The federal judiciary is often the last hope for people who are seeking justice. And I really believe that our probation and pretrial services officers have a significant role to play in making sure that people have access to that justice. Welcome to Professional Responsibility in U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services. At their national conference in 2002, Chief U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services officers endorsed the creation of a Charter for Excellence that articulates the shared professional attributes, goals, and mission-critical values of officers. Since that time, the Charter has been drafted, printed, and distributed to the field and several of its elements refer explicitly to the responsibility of officers. The purpose of this program, therefore, is to explore the meaning of professional responsibility, not in a way that asks you merely to consider the differences between responsibility and irresponsibility, but rather the connections between responsibility and excellence. To get the discussion going, I'm joined by Matt Rowland of the Office of Probation and Pretrial Services. Matt, welcome. Thank you, Mark. As someone who's worked at virtually every level of the federal system, from line officer to now deputy at OPPS, what's your conception of professional responsibility, particularly as that term relates to the core role and duty of officers? Well, my view of professionalism and professional responsibility uh, took shape even before I joined the probation and pretrial services system. Um, like many uh, people in our system, I'm a big fan of sports. And sports and professional athletes sort of define professionalism. A professional athlete is expected to perform at an exceptional level, uh, not just be mediocre, not the average Joe on the block, but to be exceptional day in and day out and to prepare themselves to be able to perform at that level. In my mind, that was the view of professionalism I had when I started my career. And the longer I've stayed with the probation and pretrial services system, that definition, I think, applies in our system as well. Now, why apply a standard of excellence to probation and pretrial services work like we've done with the Charter of Excellence? Certainly, uh, I think an officer can reasonably argue uh, that me, an officer, uh, look, I've uh, uh, adhered to my constitutional mandate, to the statutory mandate, to the mandate as expressed in the monographs that are relevant to my work, and that should be good enough. So in your view, why isn't good enough good enough? In our case, I believe we're a profession. We're not just merely a job or an occupation. 
we're a calling, we're a profession. And it, what sets an, a profession apart, in my mind, is that, again, that expectation of excellent performance. Not just aiming for the middle, not just mediocrity, but exceptional performance. That's why we just can't, as officers or support staff in the probation pretrial services system, try to dissatisfy the minimum, why we have to go for the higher goal of excellence. Okay. Now, coming back down to earth, let's talk a little bit about the daily grind. And my question is, do you think that the daily grind in probation and pretrial services work uh, presents an obstacle for officers and managers who are out there trying to achieve excellence? And if you do, do you have any advice for officers and managers who are out there every day in the field trying to do the right thing? Absolutely. The daily grind is a major obstacle to professionalism and excellence. Um, it has a cumulative effect that, that day in, that day out. And going back to the analogy of professional athletes, they usually have the advantage of performing once a week or having shortened seasons. Probation and pretrial services officers and support staff have to perform every single day. They have to get that game face on every day. Okay, so how do you get the game face on? I think it's extremely important to keep in mind why we joined this system in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, most of the people I'm familiar with join to make a difference. It's not just merely for a job that has a security with it or a salary, but it's a, a true profession to make a positive difference. And that constant reminder, the reaffirmation of the importance of our work is what's necessary. That's why I think the Charter is such an excellent resource. It embodies what we hold important, why we're doing what we do. And it's very important to take the time to review that. And I think the Charter, again, is an excellent resource to keep people motivated. Matt, thank you. Thank you. Now, let's join a distinguished panel as they debate, consider, and explore professional responsibility in U.S. probation and pretrial services. Welcome, panelists. I'd like to welcome you to the Southern District of Sunnyville. The district has both a U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services office. It's a Thursday morning, and our Pretrial Services officer, let's call him Officer Mason, uh, is having a fairly easy day of it so far. But it's early, and things could change. Um, his supervisor, for our purposes, let's refer to her as Supervisor Phillips Williams, heads down the hall knocks on the door of Officer Mason's office, sticks her head in, cheerily greets him, uh, and alerts him to the fact that a new defendant has been brought in, Mr. John Fisher. He was arrested uh, earlier this morning uh, after he had not responded to several summonses. Supervisor Phillips Williams hands Officer Mason a copy of the indictment and asks him to interview this new defendant and to prepare the bail report. Officer Mason reviews the indictment, which relates the story of how Mr. Fisher, a plaintiff's attorney, has allegedly stolen over a million dollars uh, from three clients. And what makes the alleged offense particularly troubling is that all three of the clients are severely physically disabled juveniles. Officer Mason makes his way down to the lockup where Fisher is being held. He sees Fisher, and Fisher appears to be disheveled, despondent, shaken. Clearly, something is amiss. Officer Mason, you're going to introduce yourself to the defendant. What are you going to say, and why are you going to say it? Well, Mark, I'm going to tell him my name. I'm going to tell him I'm Charlie Mason. I'm a United States Pretrial Services officer. I'm going to explain my role for being there. And that role is to get information regarding this defendant's background so that the judge will know something more than what they're charged with. That information will assist the court in making a decision regarding release or detention in this case. Then I would read them the notice of the defendant, which explains to the defendant their rights involved in the pretrial services aspect. OK. Now, Mr. Fisher has already had uh, or has had a uh, contact with law enforcement when he was brought in, and, and now he's had contact with you. How is your role different than that of law enforcement, and w what are you going to say, or how are you going to say it in order to help differentiate your role? I would tell Mr. Fisher that I'm, objective, I'm an objective party in this case. I'm there to get background information. I do not work for the prosecutor, nor do I work for the defense. I work for the court, 
and I'm only going to talk about their background, not the facts of the case or what they're charged with. Now, you're a public official and you work for the court. Do you view yourself as having power over uh, our defendant here? Or let's talk about that a little bit. I would not view myself as having power over de of a defendant. I would say that I have a tremendous impact on what happens to that defendant in the system, as well as an impact on the community that they may return to. Okay. Now, what if Mr. Fisher says to you, you know, I have a lawyer, but he doesn't need to be here. Let's just get the thing over with. What do you do? I'd want to make sure that I understood Mr. Fisher correctly, and that, that's his intent. I would also want to make sure that he is aware that if he cannot afford an attorney, one would be appointed. At that point, if I've understood him, then I would continue or begin the interview at that stage. Okay. I want to go to our uh, criminal defense lawyer, uh, Greg Poe. And Greg, um, could you tell us how a pretrial interview might be different if you were present? Well, if, if a lawyer is present, I mean, the goal, of course, is to uh, provide accurate information to the court. Uh, Defense attorneys certainly don't uh, dispute that goal. The real issue is protecting, uh, from my perspective, in most cases, uh, probably all cases, uh, the, the real issue is to ensure that while pretrial's uh, objectives are met on behalf of the court, the defendant's uh, rights in connection with the prosecution are met. Because one thing that is easy to forget is pretrial might be focusing on uh, getting information to the court um, treatment of a defendant who needs treatment and so forth, but this is in the context of a criminal prosecution with very, very severe consequences, even in the simplest case. Okay, so Mr. Mason has said his role is to sort of be objective, to be impartial, to represent the court. Your role is different. My role is to protect the interests of my client. I have a duty of uh, zealous advocacy on behalf of the client, loyalty on behalf of the client, certainly a duty of candor to the court at all times, which overlays uh, everything. Uh, but the duty to the client is the fundamental duty, and therefore, pretrial's goals, my goals, might conflict in a particular case, although what I do as much as possible is to try to facilitate the interview so that my client's interests are protected, but pretrial gets what it needs to get for the court. Okay, stop right there. Officer Mason, Mr. Poe going to make your job more difficult? Mr. Poe may make my job more challenging because the information that I need to uh, make an appropriate recommendation to the court, I may have to look elsewhere to get that information. So it may make it more challenging. Okay. And you're going to rise to that challenge? Yes, I okay. hope so. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's say, just for the sake of argument here, that our interview uh, proceeds, let's just say that maybe there are even no visual cues uh, that led you to question whether there may be the need for the attorney here or whatever, that the thing is going to proceed. Um, and you obtain the following information over the course of the interview. Mr. Fisher tells you that he's 38 years old and he's a resident of the Southern District of Sunnyville. He was born in Munich, Germany and is a German citizen, but he moved to the United States and to Sunnyville uh, when he was 14 with his parents. Um, he's a permanent resident alien. Um, he's divorced and has custody of his four-year-old daughter. He has a law degree uh, and has practiced law in Sunnyville since 1991. His income is approximately $200,000 a year. He has assets of approximately 600000 and liabilities of about 200000 He says he has no substance abuse problems, and he reports that he's generally in good physical health, but he does alert you to the fact that several years ago in 1996, he had a severe automobile accident where he sustained a head injury, and while he hasn't really had any lasting effects from that. He does occasionally uh, suffers from severe headaches, especially at uh, high periods of stress. Um, he says he's never been uh, before arrested or involved in any juvenile or criminal proceedings. Um, and I want to move on, but before I do, Mr. Poe, any problem with that information? And would there be any difference if you were present? If I'm present, let me just pick out a couple of examples sure. in the interest of time. One is this is a, a financial crime that's alleged. And in that sort of a case, and in many other cases as well, uh, questions about a defendant's assets, finances, and so forth, he could very well be incriminating himself. If I'm there, I'm going to be very, very careful about letting anyone answer those sorts of questions. Uh, another issue would be inquiries about criminal history. If I'm there, I am very wary about that sort of an inquiry because it could have an ultimate effect on a defendant's sentence under the guidelines if a defendant, for example, talks about uh, various criminal history uh, 
episodes that might not otherwise be, uh, uh, be detected by a probation office, and it's not my job on behalf of my client to help him get, get a higher sentence. Okay, so you're not trying to, you know, prevent information from coming to the fore as a way of, of uh, making Mr. Mason's job more difficult. You are carrying out your responsibility to your client I have by trying to control that information. Right, and, and that's a, th those are constitutional issues that I'm discussing, and those, are, uh, and those are serious ethical obligations that I have to my client. It's a role-related, uh, I think, system in which, uh, when it works best, it works organically, and everyone plays the role, they play it with integrity, things hopefully work out well in the end. Very good. All right, let's move on. And uh, Officer Mason's investigation prior to the bail hearing confirms uh, a few things. In terms of employment, uh, Mr. Fisher has been temporarily suspended from the practice of law. Um, in terms of his family, we find out that his parents several years ago relocated back to Germany, but you were able to conduct a telephone interview with them. Um, and they said that uh, Mr. Fisher uh, had a stable upbringing, middle class upbringing, nothing unusual. However, they noted that in the past several months, perhaps the last year, he had been uh, expressing in some extended periods of unhappiness. They attributed that to his relatively recent divorce, the fact that he was transitioning to single parenthood, uh, and the fact that he had a very busy law practice and he was trying to juggle all of this. So they, you know, to them it didn't seem unusual or strange. Um, A check of the criminal records databases doesn't turn up anything unusual. No arrest or criminal records on this defendant. Um, you need to prepare the bail report, assess the risks pre pre uh, presented by Fisher. Okay. After the investigation, I believe that the risk that I would have identified, the first risk would be the defendant failed to respond to a summons that was sent and was arrested. That would certainly be of concern to me. Uh, further, the defendant's ties to Germany, his parents uh, now living there, as well as his citizenship status. And thirdly, I believe that I would also be concerned about employment simply as a danger issue for potential third-party risk. Okay, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about sort of the thinking ahead that you're going to have to do, and let's talk about some of those issues. You, you mentioned one, potentially employment. Are there any other issues, you know, that may not be front and center right now, but where you may, you know, just sort of may raise some hunches or just concerns on your part. Absolutely. This defendant's mental health uh, information is not enough for me to believe that it will go to non-appearance or danger at this particular time, but it is certainly a part of the puzzle that I will tuck away, and I may need that information at a later date and time. Circumstances may change, and that may have an impact on non-appearance and or danger. Okay. I want to go to uh, Bonnie Phillips-Williams, and, and Bonnie, get your perspective you know, on things that have been said thus far, perhaps the differences between the role of the officer in carrying out his function versus the role of the criminal defense attorney in carrying out his function, just to sort of elaborate on what we've been talking about so far in terms of professional responsibilities, differences in roles, that kind of thing. I think Gregory described the difference in the roles very well. The, de the defense attorney is an advocate for the defendant. Mm -hmm. We are to be objective officers of the court. But it was interesting listening to Gregory talk as well. As pretrial officers, we are very cognizant of the Constitution, and it's actually part of the Charter for Excellence that we uphold the constitutional principles of the presumption of innocence, the right against incrimination and the right against excessive bail. Mm -hmm. So I know that Charlie is thinking of all those things and, and we actually dovetail with the defense and of course the government as well in that area. Okay, um, let's move on and talk about something that I know is of concern um, to the officers on this panel and certainly to officers in the field and that is uh, collateral requests. Okay, um, let's go back a minute and talk about arrest history uh, since that's such an important uh, part of an investigation in terms of assessing risk. Um, what if Fisher ha had lived for part of his life in another state um, and you, Officer Mason, needed to request assistance from another district? What are your expectations and how do they relate to your responsibility and to the responsibility of the system as a whole? Well, 
I think that first and foremost, I would expect that that other office where I would be calling to request this information would be just as busy as we are. And I realize that it will be an imposition on that office because they've got to stop their investigation process at that point and help myself or another officer who would be calling in at that time. But I do expect that they take the time to uh, provide me with the information that I need because they work under the same guidelines. They know that we are trying to provide the objective information to the court, all the information that the court needs to make an informed decision. I have recently requested a collateral from another district and they went above and beyond the call of duty. It's very easy to run a criminal history in your district and send it to that particular requesting officer. However, there may be abbreviations, there may be dispositions you're not able to read from the faxed report or a telephoned report. And this officer took the time to actually type out a criminal history and made sure that I understood it. They followed up with a phone call, said, did you get the information? Is there anything else you or your court needs at this time? And that was really a great thing for them to do. It, it helped me in fulfilling the obligation of giving the information so that they can go towards you know, non-appearance and danger issues, as well as excessive bail and protecting the community. All that information is part of that puzzle that I mentioned about earlier. Okay, so an officer in another district has a responsibility to help you carry out your responsibility and should look at it that way. Is that accurate? Is that, yes, definitely. Um, but and also, let me ask the chiefs uh, and Craig Sy, let's, let's hear from you uh, about what, how you think that, you know, this interaction regarding collateral requests um, in affect interdistrict relations and sort of the responsibility of the system as a whole? Well, the collateral request uh, problem, um, and it was addressed as recently as about a year and a half ago in a News and Views article, but it did discuss the problems uh, and the, the deterioration of the process, I think was the term used, and, and that's unfortunate because one of the things the Charter captures as a critical mission value is that we work together and to have officers, for lack of a better expression, feud about the collateral process right. uh, doesn't seem consistent uh, with that, that value. Um, I, think it, I think you expect the kind of response you would hope to get, and, and the response is a professional one. Um, but I think sometimes we forget because we mail it away or email the request, we forget there's somebody at the other, another officer that has the same goals and objectives, uh, same concerns and, and same expectations. And time crunch. And time crunch. Yeah, okay. Um, getting back to the, the facts of our case, we're talking about Defendant Fisher. And let's just jump ahead to the initial appearance. Um, and let's say that the bail report recommends that Fisher be released on bond with the following special conditions that he report to pretrial services as directed, that he actively seek employment and provide proof of such to pretrial services, that he surrender his passport and not obtain a new one during the pendency of the proceedings, and that he not travel outside the district of Sunnyvale unless permitted by the court. Now let's go to our prosecutor, Barbara Kate. You're the prosecutor in this case. What's your responsibility, generally, but uh, at this and at this bail hearing specifically? Well, I actually think on these facts that this defendant is a flight risk. I'm okay. realistic enough to know that as a nonviolent offender, my chances are kind of slim of having him detained. But I think he's a flight risk because he hasn't responded to those summonses. He has just lost uh, perhaps his most powerful tie to the community. He's lost his job and he's lost his license to get another one. He not only has very few family ties in the area, he has a daughter who he can take with him, but he has no other family ties. But he affirmatively has family ties in another country. The notion that um, he can surrender a passport doesn't really protect us. He can leave the country on his green card as a permanent resident. Um, he can, the issue of these assets concerns me for two reasons. One, it means he has the assets with which to flee the country. But he also has the ability, if he's left in the community, to dissipate these assets, and they might serve as a, a pool for um, uh, uh, restitution to the victims in this case. And so I'm worried about those assets. I'm worried about a lot of things about leaving him at liberty in the community, although I'm realistic enough to know that what I really have to do at this point is figure out some more conditions of release to try and protect against those, because it's unlikely that with a nonviolent offender, I'm going to have him preventively detained. Very good. All right, I want to go to Officer Mason. Officer Mason, AUSA Kate has presented some pretty compelling reasons here 
uh, some pretty compelling concerns. Um, isn't it your responsibility just to go along with those? No, it's not my responsibility to go along with those. It would be easy to go along with that recommendation. However, it's my professional responsibility, and the Charter, again, reminds us to uphold the constitutional principle of the presumption of innocence. Mm -hmm. And the court, particularly the magistrate judges and the district judges, they want to hear what my recommendation is. And I've got to do my objective investigation, get all of the information that I can gather, verify that, and present it to the court, and it needs to be my recommendation. And if I can articulate those reasons well, then I believe that the prosecutor, who may not agree, will certainly respect me and know where I'm coming from on those issues. Okay, well, funny that you should mention our magistrate judge. <laughs> judge Blake, I want to take you back to those days of yesteryear when you sat on the magistrate bench uh, and ask you, um, how does Officer Mason's responsibility relate to your role as the magistrate judge? Um, and what are you going to expect from Officer Mason in this case? Well, he's articulated a lot of what I would expect, and it sounds as though he'd be, he'd be doing a very good job. Uh, in many ways, the pre-trial service officer's role is very similar uh, to mine. Um, I uh, know that his boss back in Texas will have will be very happy to have heard you say that. <laughs> good. <laughs> well, I, my district has an excellent pretrial service and probation yes, office, so I have good background here. Um, but it is a role of impartiality. It is a role of objectivity and independence. Uh, I certainly hope that that is what I am doing, in the, and and it is certainly what I would expect from the pretrial services officer. Um, the other point I would make, however, is that the highest part of that professionalism, it would include flexibility uh, and alternatives because I need to listen to the pretrial services officer. I also need to listen to the prosecutor and the defense attorney. And it's possible, for example, not this particular case, but pretrial service might have recommended detention. Uh, the defense attorney has persuaded me that that's not necessary. I expect that the pretrial services officer, being objective, independent, and professional, will have some alternatives available for me, and then I can turn to them and say, well, if I do release this person, then what do you recommend? And that they will have anticipated that, brought their knowledge and experience to bear, and be able to give me some alternatives um, within their independent framework. Very good. All right. Let's skip ahead a little bit more to uh, the decision. And the, the court's satisfied with the report's initial recommendations and releases Fisher on bond with those conditions. Um, I want to go now to some of the concerns of the community and, and, and talk with uh, Cleopatra Jones. Um, you're Fisher's neighbor. How do you feel about having him come back on pretrial release back at home? And let's even take it a step further, all right? Let's say for the sake of argument, that we have a different kind of a defendant here. Let's say we have a defendant who may be one accused of a serious drug or weapons offense, um, presents a different type of a danger, perhaps, to the community. Um, how are you going to react to that, and what are you going to expect of the court and of Officer Mason? From the court, and as well as from Officer Mason, as a victim, directly or indirectly in part of the community, we would expect to have an open dialogue where we can focus on the issues at hand, to have the pre-service officer come forward to the community and talk to us about their concerns, what plans they have set forward in securing the release of this person, and how they are going to be able to adjust to the community, and as well as the community adjusting to them. Because understanding that the community has fears, and our fears need to be addressed. And it's important for us to be able to dialogue with you on every level, as well as the victim, the defendant, and the ones that are all involved in this, so that we have a sense of idea of what is going on, what services you're going to provide for this defendant. In other words, what have you done about jobs? What have you done about counseling? You know, different types of things. How are you going to keep him away from his peers and the events and the problems that caused him to get into this problem? How are you going to ensure that he does not fall right back into the same pattern? And to understand that you're going to have an open-door policy 
directly around the clock so that when we need you, we are able to reach you, not just by a number, but we want to be able to identify you by a face, someone who's directly involved with us, and feel comfortable that you're working in our best interest because we have to take the interests of the seniors, the youth, the businesses, and everybody in the community. But basically, we don't want to make him a victim again. We want to be able to feel that he can come back into the community and adjust to changes and move forward because this is a new life and, you know, set for different things. Bonnie Williams, is that a fair expectation? Yes and no. Okay. Pretrial has strict rules of confidentiality at this part of the proceeding. We, and the charter, one of the goals that matter most is, is getting out the community, community-based supervision mm -hmm. to make sure that, that our offender, whoever he is, Mr. Fisher or this other person, right. is being compliant with the conditions. So the expectation that Charlie go out in the community, that he is out there with a face, is absolutely a realistic expectation of the community at large. Whether he can discuss anything more than he's coming back, these are his conditions of bond, he probably can't talk about whether he's getting treatment, not getting treatment, but he can talk about, yeah, we're going to help him get a job. So it's kind of a balance, and, and Charlie is a professional, and most officers as a professional, or all officers hopefully, know that, that tight walk they have to walk with the confidentiality versus answering to the concerns of the community. There, so in other words, there are things you can do to try to allay the concerns, anxieties, or fears of folks in the community. Absolutely, and the best one is getting out there. Okay. Cleopatra, did you have a response? I understand that, and I think primarily the biggest thing is dealing with fear. Fear is something that everybody addresses in a different way. And taking the circumstances for all of the crimes or the things that came about, remember that the community has a pretty good knowledge. You know, we take for granted that the community is not aware of things. We are very well educated into what's going on, and some of us know the law just as well as the professionals. So we are not asking you to break any confidentiality. We're asking you to be just totally honest with us, to work with us and give us the same respect. Do empathy. Realize that if this was your neighborhood and you lived there, what would you expect from us? So equally, we want you to take and look at the issue and focus and give us as much information as we need so that we can dialogue. So I think, I think ahead, Cleopatra will be encouraged to note that the Charter for Excellence does um, task us or, or remind us of our obligation to positively impact the community and, and, and be considerate of the community's concerns. So okay. I think that's consistent with the Charter. Okay. Let's move ahead to supervision and let's assume now that Mr. Fisher has been on supervision for several weeks. Uh, one day he arrives at the pretrial services office uh, for his regular appointment in a particularly agitated state. Um, officer Mason has been called to court unexpectedly. Being the responsible officer, he has let the receptionist and other folks in his office know that this has happened and that he has a, a client coming in um, for an appointment. Um, the receptionist tells this to Fisher, who becomes even more agitated when he hears that Officer Mason isn't there to see him. Um, Bonnie Williams, Craig Sy, what should happen in this situation? What's the correct handling imply for support staff, for officers, for management? What should happen? Since it's the pretrial services officer we're talking about, I'll let Bonnie go first. Very good. All Sound right. familiar? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> What should happen is, and this is how professionalism goes all the way down through the office, or, or that we're all the same, basically. What should happen is the, the defendant, Mr. Fisher, should get taken care of. He shouldn't have to wait till Charlie returns. The receptionist, the person at the front desk, should know we need to get him in, we need to get him spoken to, whether it's by a supervisor, by another officer, by someone, and just let him we need to be flexible and we just, everybody needs to act. That's, uh, just get it done, I think, is what we decided yesterday was the appropriate well, term. And underscore, it is the, I mean, the, the, prof or the support staff has to support um, the officers in, in what they're obligated to do uh, by statute or by charter. Mm -hmm. And um, they have to be on the same page with the goals and, and have the same values we have to be truly supportive of what we do. Um, as an aside, I would think, though, the officer, being the professional he is, does not just simply walk out the office right. and respect the schedule of the offender. He scheduled the conference, and, and so the, the, I would think the, the 
professional prudent officer would certainly try to make arrangements for that offender uh, to be seen and, and, and his uh, problems addressed uh, before he left for court. Okay. So responsibilities all the way around. All right, that sounds good, but let's do a reality check. Mr. Coates, does that reflect your experience? No, nah, that doesn't reflect my experience at all. Um, I, I was listening carefully and I didn't hear how you would deal with that situation. It's been my experience, if you come into the office and you're upset, either you go, you, they'll put you out the office. And that is not counted as a visit, <laughs> you know, even if it was a scheduled visit. Um, anytime you cause a problem or they perceive you causing a problem, then, you know, you don't get any service. You, you are forced out of the building and you're penalized for it. That's, that's just been my experience. And um, I'm just curious to see, you know, what, what would the person do? I mean, how would, what, can, what, what would a staff person do that would be any different from what you've always done? Well, what the person, what my receptionist would do would be to call one of the people in the office. I mean, we've had this happen. There's, a, there's an offender out front. He seems very upset. Somebody will respond immediately. We'll take him or her inside and sit them down. I mean, usually there's a reason why you're upset. You have coming from court. You're going to be late to court. You've got to meet a lawyer. You've got to do a UA, and you've got to do it now. Whatever it is, the officer in the office will just respond to it then. I mean, our goal is to not have you be penalized because you're having a bad day. I mean, these people have bad days every day, unfortunately. And there will be days that we can't, I mean, what you're upset about, we can't help you with. But we'll at least not leave you out there and then turn you away because you're having a bad day. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, all right, let's move on. So this the situation, sorry, go ahead, Greg, yeah, please. Another thing I think could be useful in a lot of instances would be to, for the lawyer to be contacted. Um, lawyers frequently can be uh, very useful. I, that happens in the District of Columbia, uh, the office that, uh, that I just left, the Federal Public Defender, has an excellent relationship with the Pretrial Services Office and with the individual officers. And one of the ways some of these problems can be averted and some of the consequences in a, from a sentencing perspective that, that we discussed earlier can be um, avoided. Some of the adverse consequences to the defendant is perhaps to bring the lawyer in to try to, to uh, calm things down a little bit and, and work things out. And sometimes I think that's, that's something that I would ask pretrial officers to do if they're not otherwise uh, focused on that. Very good. Raymond, I want to come back to you, but I wanted to get a reaction from Officer Mason. Uh, is that something that sounds reasonable to you? Is that something in terms of the interaction with defense counsel and sort of to try to get a handle on the situation and sort of get things settled down? Yes, it certainly does. Okay. And the charter, again, calls for us to work in a collegial environment right. working together. We all bring a different piece of the puzzle together, and together, hopefully, justice is served. And it would certainly be beneficial to let the defense counsel know uh, and discuss some of those matters with them because they also are able to talk to the defendant and together if there's something that needs to be responded to, together we can do that hopefully. Mm -hmm. I mean the defense counsel has developed a, a, a relationship with your client um, and therefore can be helpful in calming matters down and strategizing on what to do next and how to handle it. I think frequently it's just a matter of going into a, a private room with the client discussing what the concern is and I think at that point, particularly if there's a, a good relationship with a defense lawyer and there's a relationship of trust, the problem might end at that point. Um, some, and then if it doesn't, it can, be, uh, it can be addressed and probably worked out with the officer immediately after that. Okay. Mr. Coates, I know you had a response. Go ahead. Um, I, I just want to return back to the point where you have a, a distraught person. Mm -hmm. But I want to take it somewhere into one of my own personal experiences. What happens if we have a scheduled appointment and you missed that appointment? You had to go to court, you know, called in sick. Um, whose responsibility is it to reschedule? The officer. That too has not been my experience. Well, <laughs> depending on the circumstances, of course, if the officer left sick and it was a, at the last minute, but I would hope that a professional officer would treat you as a professional would treat you. That if it's 
you know, if you're going to be out next week and you're supposed to come in on Tuesday, either arrange with another officer to see you if you have to come in every Tuesday, which pretrial they freak you may have to, or <coughs> arrange for you to come in on Wednesday when you're actually going to be there. Let me, let, let, <laughs> no, this is kind of dead to me because it's happened to me on several different occasions. Um, since I've been out, what I've learned what professionals do, if you are the cause for the meeting not taking place, then you call and you set up a mutual date to reschedule. In my experience, I've never gotten that call. I've always had to call. Um, and whenever they say come, I've always had to come. Regardless of my professional personal responsibilities, I had to reschedule and reshape my schedule because my parole or my probation was primary. That's it, buddy. You do this. This is what you do. Everything else got to come after this. And, and, that's, and I, I just wanted to know how does the charter speak to that kind of situation? The charter has several values which we call mission critical, and one of them is to treat everyone with dignity and respect. And to me, treating a person like dignity and respect is to treat you like I would want to get treated. But, so. but I agree, it, 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 it probably, that isn't your experience, and, and you're not believing in spite of the language of the charter. But, but I think a better practice is always, if you're gonna have a, 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 an individual come into your office, a scheduled appointment. And, your responsibility is to be there as scheduled, and I think our professional responsibility, certainly if we can't be there, and no, we're not gonna be there, to take the initiative to reschedule it. And I, and I do, I think we owe you that. And I hope you have that experience, at least in the federal system. In the future. <laughs> <laughs> you come to the district in Nebraska, we'll make sure you do that, all right? Rob Taylor, I know you wanted to uh, sure. interact, go ahead. Well, it, it should be noted, Mark, that in, in terms of probation, there's a re-emphasis on community-based supervision. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that whole coming to the office thing is going to be de-emphasized. Uh, certainly we've got to respect the offender's time uh, and, and what it takes to get down to the office, the fact that they may have to try to find some place to park, mm -hmm. they may have to take off from work, which is certainly you know inconsistent with what we're trying to do with supervision. Mm -hmm. So hopefully there will be less of the types of situations yeah, that he's talking about. Well, I think isn't that why we're all here? I mean, to talk about you know what the reality is, what we aspire to, and maybe talk about some of the ways in which we can get to those things that we aspire to. Uh, that may be next time. Next time, right? <laughs> Ninety-minute program here. Don't want to be too ambitious, or much more ambitious. Anyway, uh, moving right along, um, let's talk about. Uh, let, let's just say that the situation is diffused. Um, but Officer Mason has done some more investigation, worked things out with uh, uh, Mr. Poe uh, in terms of the situation for Mr. Fisher. Um, and it becomes clear that Mr. Fisher has some pretty serious mental health issues. Uh, and Officer Mason asks Judge Blake to impose a mental health condition. Uh, and Judge Blake does so. Um, after several, several visits, the therapist informs Officer Mason that Fisher has major depression uh, and generalized anxiety disorder, and that he also has observed symptoms of bipolar disorder. Um, a psychiatric evaluation uh, concludes that Fisher's bipolar and lithium is prescribed. Now, in terms of the disposition of the case, moving, moving ahead a bit, Fisher pleads guilty to one count, uh, to one charge of wire fraud, and the non-binding plea agreement includes the following terms. Fisher accepts responsibility for the offense, He'll serve 30 months in prison with a three-year term of supervised release. He agrees to pay restitution subject to actual loss. The sentence in the agreement includes a vulnerable victim-related adjustment. And the parties agree not to ask for any additional enhancements or departures. So now we're talking pre-sentence investigation. Speaking of the good old days, Officer Sai, I'd like to take you back to your days of conducting pre-sentence and carrying out pre-sentence investigations and drafting reports. Um, you've been assigned the investigation of Mr. Fisher. 
Could any of the stipulations in the plea agreement, what's your approach, sort of starting at the beginning, here? what's your approach going to be, what's your mindset going to be, what's your responsibility in carrying out this investigation, and are the terms of the plea agreement going to play into that in any way? Was that, in just, that, order, was that just one question, Mark? <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> let's talk about the plea agreement first. Okay. The, the plea agreement, um, obviously, you, you can't be oblivious to it, but at a point, in, I, I think you set that aside for the time being. I okay. think you honestly do. I think sometimes that drives how officers approach their investigation, and you don't want the plea agreement to do that because you are an impartial fact finder, and you go about your business and, 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 the, and the obligation um, in such a manner. So you, you really do as the impartial fact finder, you, you try to determine the fact situation. Okay. And then how that applies and reconciles with the plea agreement is, uh, is another matter really for another time. And is obviously addressed in a, in a portion of the report. As it relates to the plea, was the other part of your question, what's the obligation of the pre-sentence investigation report officer? Yeah. Uh, but, but you sort of covered that with the impartiality and sort of well, carrying out that sort of well, well and that's why I think the Charter for Excellence is such a good thing, and this is not a, a dialogue on guideline applications. Right. It's not a dialogue on um, how to write a, a report and how to format a report. But uh, one of the um, goals of the pre-sentence report writer is to write an objective report, uh, one that ver contains verified information, and certainly um, assist the court in making a fair uh, sentencing decision. In the, uh, in, the operatives there are, it's objective, it's, it's verified, and, and it, it's, it's fair. And I think that's our, one of our professional goals, and the Charter speaks to that. And to accomplish that, um, an officer certainly has to bring to that process a host of professional skills, communication skills, investigation skills, and certainly some um, analytical skills. Um, but the biggest thing they've got to, I think, bring to the table and to the process is their impartiality. And that's something, uh, 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 an obligation of ours, a professional obligation of ours that is sometimes ignored, not truly appreciated or understood. But it is that impartiality, impartiality that distinguishes us from the other players in the process. Okay. So I guess I encourage probation officers, uh, pre-sentence report officers, to be impartial and professional. Barbara Cate, do you fully understand that role? Well, I, let me say this. The sentencing guidelines are, in my view, a compact among the players okay. to sort of play fair. I mean, the, they took from the discretion of a judge most, um, most um, value judgments as to conduct. They're, the conduct is the conduct. That's why there's relevant conduct. You can consider all five charges if the conduct is there, even if there's only a plea of guilty to one. You can consider whether or not, um, you should consider whether or not all of the enhancements should apply. The one, I guess, that's most glaringly missing here is a breach of a position of trust, which would be one that would obviously apply, and yet it appears as if the lawyers have decided that neither side will ask for it. Um, that's something that that the probation officer should be identifying as, because they are actually the fact finder for the court. Correct. They should be identifying that for the court so that everything is sort of out there and on the table. And under the guidelines, the conduct is the conduct and the enhancements are the enhancements. And if the court is not permitted because of the guidelines to sort of put some of them to the side or not consider them, then neither can the parties manipulate whether or not um, that particular factor is considered. And it's not a situation, since we're talking about ethics, where you can sort of, with a wink and a nod, say, I'm not going to ask for it, but then sit down in a pre-sentence interview with the pre-sentence report writer and say, you know, put the facts out there subtly or not so subtly to suggest that they go around the back and ask for the enhancement for uh, breach of a position of trust. If you're not asking for it, you're not asking for it. But I think what you need to do in the context of a plea discussion is to say to the probation officer who's writing this report, you know, it's not in there, we've agreed not to ask for mm -hmm. it, 
but I want to defend this plea agreement, even though it looks to you as if there's certain things missing, for, for a variety of reasons. I want you to know what these reasons are, just as I'm going to tell the court what these reasons are. We have vulnerable victims who are vulnerable now, just as they were then. They don't particularly need to or want to participate in a long, drawn-out court process. They don't want to have to come to court and face a cross-examination mm -hmm. about something about which they were vulnerable to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, we want to see if we can spare them that. Um, there are reasons why, um, if it's the case, it's not really here, but I can remember cases where it was, where we're somewhat sympathetic to the defendant's situation. And this is why we sort of are trying to get this to a point where this can be resolved by a disposition short of trial. It, yes, these other factors are out there, but we want you to understand why, though they could apply, we're asking that they not apply so that we can resolve this with this disposition. But I think we have to be upfront about it. I mean, I don't think we're trying to sort of get the enhancement through the back door or sort of say we agree to a set of facts different than what reality suggests mm -hmm. is true. We have to sort of stand up to what the facts are and stand up to why it is we're asking for this plea agreement nevertheless. Craig, reactions? I was going to wait for the judge's reaction. Oh, good. All right. <laughs> Judge Blake? Well, <laughs> I think uh, Due deference. I'm, going to, I'm going to agree essentially with all of that, but um, it's certainly true that I'm looking for an impartial and objective investigation, but I think that what the prosecutor has just said points up the importance also of recognizing roles and recognizing what is going to be of most assistance to the court, and I heard those words, assist the court. Um, quite frankly, in, in Maryland, um, uh, we rely very heavily on the probation officer for an analysis of the guidelines, uh, for their expertise in things like uh, criminal history calculations and grouping and all those arcane mm -hmm. things that I, I really need help with. Um, uh, we rely on them. I do very heavily for that special expertise in, in human behavior and mental health, the drug problems, the recommendations that they're going to come up mm -hmm. with on those fronts. That is of much more significance to me in what I am looking for from the probation officer than to review, as was suggested by this hypothetical that we all had to look at, to go back and redo the FBI agent's work, for example. Mm -hmm. I, I will live with relevant conduct as it has been defined by the people whose roles are the defense attorney and the prosecutor. Absent something obvious. Now, if, if you see something that just really seems egregious, I want you to bring it to my attention. On the guideline stipulation, if you see something you think that's obvious that's been left out, yes, bring it to my attention, and it is something that we should discuss openly and, and publicly, but you've got to recognize there are reasons why that may not have right. been asked for. So what I'm looking for that is of most assistance to the court is not revisiting all the facts, but concentrating on where your expertise and your role is, makes the most difference. Can I just say one more thing there, though? Of course. <laughs> they, um, that's nice. Um, <laughs> I, I have to say, though, that there are some of these issues that are close calls. I mm -hmm. mean, it's not always black and white. And where it's a close call, I actually consider it to be good lawyering on my part to see if I can't at least make the first cut and get the probation officer on my side. Because I think if the pre-sentence report recommends something, then it's more likely that I'll have the judge looking favorably at that than if I have to climb that hill in court without the, the pre-sentence report on my side. So I really, unlike, I'm sure you get a lot of, you write a lot of pre-sentence reports, and I've read a lot where it says contact, tried to contact, tried to contact, tried to contact, and the assistant was in court, was in court, was mm -hmm. in court, and there's never been an interview there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, you know, ideally there's always an interview there, and I, I'm, what I'm saying is I'm always trying to make myself available because I want to make the first cut and be persuasive so that the pre-sentence report takes my position. I recently had a case where it was an extremely complicated calculation. It was so complicated that the probation uh, officer called the, the sentencing commission to make sure that she was right before she uh, completed the report. And what I had done was I tried even to share with her some of the drafts I was preparing of the memorandum I would file with the court because it was that important to me not to have to be first making those arguments mm -hmm. um, against the pre-sentence report in court. And I wanted to see if I could be lined up with it before I went into court. 
Okay, Greg Poe, yeah, please. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, one of the things Somehow I had a feeling you were gonna wanna <laughs> jump in, I don't know. Well, we, we, there, is a, there are four or five feet between us, so yeah, right. everything's okay. But, but the, uh, the, the thing I wanted to note is, I think transparency in the process is critical because the, the uh, ideally, I think, everything should be done in writing. The first disclosure of the PSR should be uh, the point at which the, the uh, uh, views of the government are known. Ex, ex parte contacts in any, in any sort of environment are very, very hazardous. And so I think transparency in the process, letters to the officer, copying the defense counsel, defense counsel's letters to the, to the pretrial, I'm sorry, probation officer, copying the, the prosecutor uh, are, are essential. I think the interview of the client is sort of sui generis. I mean, the defense lawyer hopefully is sitting in on that probation interview, mm -hmm. pre-sentence report interview with the client. And, but otherwise, I think it's, it's extremely important to, to have transparency in the process because there can be very subtle influences mm -hmm. depending on the judgments of individual probation officers and pretrial services officers in different contexts that I think have to uh, have per careful attention paid to them because uh, otherwise a lot of these adverse consequences that I think we've talked about before can result. That's always a concern of mine is how much transparency in the process is there. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Two seconds. Please, yes. And I think we get back to the impartiality that we've spoken about in the charter, that if the prosecutor comes to an officer and, and gives her side, my hope is the officer would then turn around and call the defense attorney and say, look, you know, if we don't have it in writing, this is what I'm being asked, what is your position? So at least we have the impartiality. So if it comes up at court, the officer can be examined and be a professional and, and tell the court, We've done due diligence on both sides, and this is where we stand. And that ability to communicate and mediate seems to be one of our professional responsibilities. So, Judge Blake, did you have a response or reaction? No, I think okay. uh, I, I think that's 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 been summarized very well. Um, and uh, I'm to say I, I think that there are special there's special expertise that the probation officer can bring. Um, it, it is, I, I will just repeat the point that I made about the pretrial services officer, though. Part of what you're doing in that pre-sentence report is identifying these issues, and you may feel strongly that a particular enhancement should apply. Again, it may be that in listening to what the defense attorney and the prosecutor have to say about their reasons for not requesting that enhancement, I'm going to go with them. That does not in any way uh, reflect poorly on the probation officer. I will appreciate it having been brought to my attention. Right or wrong, I made the decision that I felt felt was right, but that flexibility, responsibility, I think one of the things in the charter is, is fostering a collegial environment. You're going to see that prosecutor again. You're going to see that defense attorney again. You're certainly going to see the judge again. That's right. Be professional, move on. It's the same for me. I go into court and make a decision. Half the people don't like me when I'm done, right. Right. but right. I, you, right. well, you got to go for, on. For officers to understand, you are the, the decision maker. We're the impartial fact finders, and as long as we all agree that uh, we're not bridled by the, the plea agreement. Uh, you want as much information as we can possibly find out and verify, and um, that's our professional role. Absolutely. And then what you do with that information is, of course, we hope you follow our recommendation. <laughs> usually, usually. Yeah, but in all seriousness, I, I mean, couldn't it, what's the effect or impact, uh, Craig, on, a, on officers, I mean, to the extent you can generalize about, you know, going into a meeting, officers have worked hard, put together uh, this pre-sentence report, have really sort of left no stone unturned in terms of the investigation. They go in and perhaps the judge does not agree with the recommendation or goes a different way or whatever. I, I can't say that th that doesn't impact on officers mm -hmm. and it impacts adversely. They're, they're busy, mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot of a lot of things going on and a lot of things going on to, to, to complete a pre-sentence investigation report. They think they do a thorough job. They think they verify everything. They think they're on solid ground when they recommend things and analyze things. And it, it, it comes as uh, hard words uh, when, 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 when that is discounted in court or, or uh, the court decides to go another way. But, but the, I think the true professional uh, can go beyond that, quite frankly. I mean, I think that's the professional challenge. Um, if we want somebody to respect our role that we play as an impartial fact finder, then we certainly, and I don't think 
that should be lost. We've got to respect what the, the AUSA does for a living and, and what Greg does and, and what the court decides. And, and I think it's, it, it's hypocritical to say, respect us for our role and what we do, but by the way, if you don't do what we tell you to do, then we're not going to respect uh, uh, your stake in the process. Right. So. Now, chances are there, there's, there's going to be at some point a meeting between the pre-sentence officer and the, and the judge. Um, what's the mindset of the officer? What does that need to be going into that in terms of the connection to that officer's responsibility and how, you know, just in terms of carrying out the process and making sure that the officer does his or her job effectively and with integrity and all these values that we talk about in the charter? Well, I don't, I don't think the meetings with the judge are necessarily standard. I, I think no, that's, not, that's all not, over the not. board. Mm -hmm. um, you would hope if, if, an, an, if an officer does have opportunity to dialogue with the court, um, um, they're prepared and, and they're well read and researched on the case. Um, but I'd like to think also that the pre-sentence report, um, and partly going to, to Greg's notion of this transparency, uh, you would hope the report speaks for itself, and that's the professional challenge. Um, again, I think it's always good to go in and talk with the court, and court in case the court wants clarification. Um, but again, I think the report primarily speaks for itself. Kind of this gets back to what, what Greg was saying about transparency, and I think there has been some change perhaps over, over the years, even while I've been familiar with the process. Mm -hmm. I think the meetings with the judge used to be a lot more Common. There uh -huh. was much more of a personal back and forth between the court and the probation officer. I think it's a it's it's a good thing to be a little more sensitive to the need to involve all the parties and and not. This goes to, to the have, ex parte communication. Absolutely, he, uh, Greg had referred to. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Now it it can happen from time to time, and I I've certainly had times when I've had a question that's something I want clarified, sure. and I'm comfortable picking up the phone and calling the probation officer and. Uh, or maybe that the probation officer will want to come to me uh, uh, about something, and, and that's fine, but that in some way that should be transmitted to the other people in this process who, um, who have an important role, just as we do, and, uh, and, and need to not have something hidden from them that may be important um, mm -hmm. that they may need to respond to. The relationship to. we have with the court is slightly different in that yes. we are your in yes. impartial fact finders, so uh, the, yes. the communique might be a little bit more justified because of that relationship that the, the other two parties wouldn't have with the court. And, I'll, and it may be a clarification of the kind that, again, will call on your expertise. I'll say, well, you've recommended right. um, drug treatment. I would hope that I could call and say to the probation officer, can you tell me a little more about that, how that 500-hour program <clears throat> works that, that somebody's going to be recommending or asking me That's for. a good segue, because I want to move forward uh, now. Uh, officer Sai has conducted an excellent investigation. He's left no stone unturned. And some of the things he's discovered are the following about uh, Mr. Fisher. Uh, the records provided by Fisher's current psychotherapist, which is the psychotherapist he had been seeing uh, during pretrial supervision, first we know that Fisher uh, has been diagnosed as bipolar. Uh, we also find out that Fisher had seen a psychotherapist when he was experiencing marital difficulties, and that diagnosis indicated that he was suffering from major depression. Uh, he was referred to for a psychiatric evaluation, and a prescription for Prozac was recommended. We also find out through the investigation that Fisher had also visited a psychotherapist while attending law school. Um, at that time, his complaints had been about depression, panic attacks, insomnia, fatigue, and difficulty in completing daily tasks. Also reported uh, that he had not wanted to go outside of his apartment, uh, that uh, he had a fear of being around others. And again, diagnosed as having major depression, a psychiatric referral was made, uh, and there's no further information beyond that point. Uh, in terms of his family, uh, Fisher's parents have temporarily returned to Sunnyville to help him uh, take care of his daughter as he goes through this process. Um, an interview with his former wife indicates that she has had little contact with Fisher since their divorce, that she sees her child every few months, and that she splits the expenses for child care with the defendant. The defendant also employs a full-time housekeeper who also serves as the child care provider. And an interview with her indicated that Fisher was a good employer and a dedicated father, but she did say that she noticed over the past several months, perhaps the past year, that she would sometimes 
you know, discover him when she reported to work, uh, having uh, uh, sleeping in his own home, home office, fully clothed, or that he would spend evenings at the office and not return. That would require her to stay at the house with the child, uh, and that these were behaviors that were of relatively recent vintage. Um, the investigation also points up that Fisher graduated from law school uh, in the top five percent of his class. Uh, we know from the um, from the uh, pretrial uh, report that he's presently unemployed, um, that uh, Fisher's former employees also noted that he would be out of the office for several days at a time over the past several months um, without notifying them, um, and that he would return to the office and spend day and night preparing for court appearances and meeting with meetings with clients. Now, Officer Sai, we know that Fisher is heading to prison for uh, about two and a half years, um, and that mental health uh, and emotional uh, conditions are not ordinarily relevant in determining whether a sentence should be outside the applicable guideline range. So why does it matter if you get so many details regarding his mental and emotional health? First of all, I went, uh, from the recitation of the fact situation, I did do an incredible job on that investigation. <laughs> I, want, I want that duly noted. Um, so noted. Thank you. Um, well, the mental and emotional uh, problems generally, uh, although I think they're dealt with when somebody's incarcerated, they generally don't go away. And, and it's, a, it's a lifetime sometimes condition and concern. Um, but, and officers fall into this pitfall all the time. They think they're writing the report for the court and that's where their obligation ends. But there's so many downstream users of the information of the report, not only the mental emotional part, but other I information. Rob will attest to the fact that supervision is dependent on our report. The Bureau of Prisons is our, uh, dependent on a report for um, classification and programming matters and, and designations and that sort of thing. Mental health people that um, will deal with our offenders when they come out in supervision, they're dependent on the report. There is even a statistical dependency on the report. So the officer has to realize, uh, again, keeping in mind that their, their report has to be relevant and, and recent and germane to the issues at hand, it, it does have um, um, considerable benefit for downstream users yes. of the report. So you've got, a, I would say, a pretty significant amount of power here in terms of putting that information, deciding what information in some to some degree goes into that report, particularly because that report is going to be central to these downstream users that you've been talking about, or the multiple audiences that you're writing mm -hmm. for. Fair yes. enough? Yes. Okay. Um, Rob Taylor, you're one of those downstream users. Let's say you're going to be the supervision officer in this case. We'll talk about, we'll get to supervision in a couple of minutes. Um, Talk about how this kind of information can help you do your job, sure. especially as the offender begins to reenter. Sure. As a good, good colleague, Craig certainly realizes the, the importance of that information to, to my particular role. Uh, I've got a responsibility to gather facts also, and certainly a big part of that fact-gathering process is a review of the PSI. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, the more information, the better, and it's my professional responsibility to, to analyze that information and to begin to formulate a plan that's going to uh, help me get my needs met and, and hopefully uh, meet the offender's needs. Very good. All right. I want to talk a little bit about, um, bef before we get, get into supervision, um, just sort of step back a little bit and talk about uh, what the role of the supervisor and the responsibility of the supervisor is. Let's just for now talk about it in the pre-sentence context, but let's just also talk about it more generally as well. Um, let's say, let's leave aside the Fisher case for a minute, and let's say uh, we have a case in which we've got an experienced pre-sentence officer uh, who includes an enhancement that would result in a longer sentence for the defendant. The defense attorney, who's a well-known, uh, not our Mr. Poe, but uh, another defense attorney who's a well-known uh, uh, lawyer, he know, he's known to be excellent but aggressive, uh, thinks the enhancement is incorrect, um, and visits the probation office to sit down with the probation officer and discuss it. Um, the officer uh, in that meeting insists that the enhancement is correct and says that, in, in his judgment, it belongs there and that he's not going to remove it. Um, the defense attorney takes a bit of umbrage at that and decides to, on his own initiative to contact the probation officer's supervisor. 
um, complaining about the allegedly incorrect application of the enhancement. He tells the supervisor that he expects the enhancement to be removed um, and that if it's not removed, he's going to take the complaint to the sentencing judge. Craig, what's the responsibility of the supervisor in this situation and why? Well, certainly not avoid the disagreement. I mean, that, that's all part of the process. It, it, it's, um, it's institutionalized uh, through the providing the draft and then your final copy to the court and the addendum process and the recommendations and that sort of thing. So disagreement between parties is, is not um, uh, unusual, mm -hmm. uh, somewhat expected. Mm -hmm. um, I would certainly, if, it, if that came to my attention, uh, I would expect a supervisor or someone to at least address the issue, uh, give the, the, the warring parties, if you will, uh, an opportunity to each say what they need to say. Um, but then to change it at the threat of, I'm going to the court, um, really wouldn't be persuasive. Um, matter of fact, I'd almost encourage it because I can imagine, and, and I don't mean to speak for the judge, but I can imagine the court's response to an attorney that felt that our application of the guidelines was maybe not consistent with their impression of the guidelines. And, and, that, and of course, that's why you have a sentencing hearing. So I say that whole process is, is, is built into, to, or that whole uh, problem of disagreeing parties is built into the system. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know Williams, I your I question. Your perspective on but this. I agree with Craig completely, but I, hopefully, before it got to the supervisor or got to us listening to the supervisor talk about it as a chief, the, the pre-sentence writer or if it's a supervision officer, whoever it is, has already staffed it with the supervisor. Okay. I mean, we're, that's the whole, the new monographs, that's what we're all looking to. I mean, we all come from different knowledge bases, we all come with different backgrounds, we all come with different experiences, and y in your own office you will find a wealth of information, and as I, I said yesterday, I, I myself have to go to people because I sometimes have knee-jerk reactions, and we all need to talk through them, so when the lawyer comes in the office, you're like, fine, go to my supervisor, I have absolutely mm -hmm. no problem, mm -hmm. because you've already staffed it and you're confident in your own report, and you, it's no longer just go there when you know you're in trouble or whatever. We, as professionals, have to seek each other out. Okay, but is it the responsibility of the supervisor and of management to send that message to officers to that, so that they feel comfortable in doing that? I think staffing is an important consideration here. Yes. And would you? Yes. Okay. I mean, you've got to have an open door. Can't be afraid to walk in and, and talk and, and not have your head bit off. And I, I know that that's a change that the system is going through, and and I think we will get there. Okay. But correct. Yeah. Just one other side as sure. it relates to the professional responsibility of the pre-sentence report writer. I think the the true professional who's done a, a, a thorough investigation and has done his or her homework isn't offended by by disagreement. And uh, I think lawyers by training learn to disagree. It's an adversarial system. It's an adversarial <laughs> system. But sometimes I think, I think probation officers are offended that their judgment, their, their analysis of a fact situation uh, comes into question. Mm -hmm. And rather than handling it professionally, uh, they take umbrage to it. And you would want the true professional to handle it professionally, not personally, mm -hmm. for lack of a better expression. Mm -hmm. So the responsibility of the officer would be to make sure that they staff it with their supervisor. The supervisor should send the message that, you know, we encourage this, that we want collaboration, we want to make sure we're doing the right thing, so that should such a situation arise, it's a no-brainer, exactly. and we're going to deal with it. But being a manager, Bonnie and I would probably both prefer that the officer resolve it with the sure. lawyer and it not go any further would be would be my ambition and, Fair and hopes. Fair enough. Yeah. Ray Raymond Cotel. It, it sounds to me that this probation officer is really, really has a tough job. Really, you know, and I I, I know I've said before I'm just amazed at the new thinking. But with this new thinking, it's, it, it seems that uh, there's the probation officer would need a lot of support from his other colleagues and his supervisor as he's go through these pushes and pulls and dealing with his own values and judgments, keeping that 
impartial view. And and um, I I just would I I would really like to hear what a probation officer would think, or how do does a probation officer really deal with all the stuff? Because he hear a lot of stuff about people's lives all the time. Everybody pushing and pulling. How does he? Where does he go? And is it necessary for him to sometimes just clean out and and uh, reexamine? You know who he is after all this. And, and so he can do the work with the kind of uh, impartiality that, you know, as a uh, as a person who may have been on pre-trial, I definitely would want that, you know. But I wouldn't feel confident that that's what I'm getting if the prosecutor can talk to him when she feels like it, and the lawyer can talk to him when he feels like it, and everybody got in his ear, and there's no place where he can get to sort all this stuff out and kind of get it clean. I mean, I wouldn't feel confident if, 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 if I, I just don't believe that that one human being, given all this he has to do all the time, could be impartial without a place to clear itself up. Does that make sense? Am I making a little bit of sense? Go ahead, Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking there's Tobacco Road in Miami. No, no. <laughs> um, Another hope is that they would feel comfortable going to their offices and uh, their supervisors or their chiefs or whoever and unloading if they need to unload. And you do need to unload. And Robert can probably, I, I'm not a line officer, I've never been a line officer, but my guess is there are days that, I mean, I hear it in the afternoon around 4 o'clock in my office when, and sometimes early in the morning too, but that you still you've got to have the communications and you've got to, you've got to talk to each other because we also have things going on in our personal lives that are affecting our judgment and our, our points of view, which is, again, why well, it's a good thing to staff, whether it's with your next-door neighbor, to just make sure that you're not running off crazy. I'll, I'll, go ahead, Rob Taylor, because I want to move into sure. supervision, so sure. go ahead. I would, re would respond that that's one of the challenges of being a probation officer. However, that's one of the benefits, the fact that we have so many different things that we've got to do. Uh, so that's what really makes this job uh, a great job and a great profession. Uh, I would like to think that there are uh, outlets within each individual office that an officer can, can talk with a supervisor, talk with another colleague, talk with a senior officer to, to get themselves grounded, uh, to get them uh, get themselves re-centered. Uh, I don't think that's as big an issue as Mr. Combs might think because uh, we enjoy that challenge, quite frankly. Very good. And we've institutionalized some of that process in the pre-sentence report process. I mean, it's just not our, our eyes on a report. We, the, the writer writes the report. He or she has a supervisor and a guideline specialist and maybe a financial investigation specialist. Then all the parties, including the, the defendant, get to see the report, respond to the report, then it's revised, and then the court, and then there's a sentencing hearing, and then, and then, then an actual sentencing. So that kind of concern, I think, is avoided by that process. And on the supervision side, you know, the, the new monograph, the new supervision monograph underscores all of that you know, your your relationship with your co-workers, your reliance on supervisor as a mentor, um, as a sounding board, as somebody, uh, as a resource. And so I think we've got enough processes in place that it would address your concerns. Very good. I want to now get to supervision. We've got only uh, several minutes left in the program. Um, and Rob Taylor, it's good that you're motivated to do this job because you get to supervise Mr. Fisher. Um, what's your responsibility to Mr. Fisher? Let's say two years, two and a half years have gone by. He's been placed now. He's coming back out. He's been placed in a community correction center for a few months. Um, you're going to have to meet with him. How's that going to work? What's your responsibility to him? Uh, how are you going to carry out that responsibility? Several different responsibilities. Initially, based on the facts that we have in this case, I'm concerned about his mental health needs uh, and the fact that he may need some type of medication. Uh, so, so initially, you know, I'm going to be trying to do some follow-up with the BOP to find out what was going on in treatment and see what he needs right now, number one. Uh, number two, what's uh, important to me is relationship building. Uh, this person is coming on to supervision. I may be supervising him for, for three years. I need to try to build up some type of rapport so that 
you know, he's more invested in complying with the conditions. And it'll make my job easier and it'll make this whole situation less stressful for him. Okay, Mr. Coates, let's say you're Mr. Fisher just for the time being. What are your expectations? People talk when they're in prison about probation officers and how great they are? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, actually, uh, as I'm coming towards release, he's centermost in my mind. Mm -hmm. And how I'm thinking about him is uh, he's my adversary. Mm -hmm. As your I, adversary. He's my adversary. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I have to see how I can get around him. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so you're going to be scheming. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm 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 coming I'm coming home, even if uh, even if I have determined that I'm going to change my life, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do the right thing, I, I I do not see my probation officer, or parole officer, as an asset. Mm -hmm. I see him as a liability, mm -hmm. and so I it's my job to convince him that he don't need to bother me. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, I should be on the least restrictive this and the least restrictive that. And my whole uh, mindset is pushing him away. Out of my out. face. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And um, hold on. Hold that thought. Mr. Taylor, he wants you out of his face. <laughs> well, my initial response is there's inherent conflict in that because very diplomatic it's, it's my responsibility <laughs> at least initially to see him more than he probably wants to see me number one mm -hmm. but again going back to the whole relationship building thing i know how he's coming to me so i'm going to try to say hey look you know this does not have to be adversarial okay i've got a job to do you don't want me to to uh, play an active part in your life and that really the offender dictates how much i'm going to see him that's the way that, that I see it. Very I mean, good. if they're doing what they're supposed to, they're complying with their conditions, then I'm left to uh, direct my energies towards someone who's, you know, less motivated to comply. Cleopatra Jones, you're the conscience of the community here. How does that sound to you? Sounds like they need to really sit down and talk. That, you know, there has to be some barriers, but there has to be some understanding because this is an adjustment for Mr. Coates as well. He's coming back into a community where a lot of things have changed. And I would hope that the supervision officer will be able to give him those guidelines to say, okay, I know you don't want me in your face, you don't want me around, but there are certain things I need to share with you. And we need to sit down and start building that rapport where you establish your open communication because that's going to be the key for your freedom and for him doing his job in a positive way and that you don't become a threat to the community because we want to understand that whatever you need will be provided for you and that someone is there to make sure that these doors opens and things are available. But, but, Go but, ahead, Rand. But one of the reasons why my approach is the way it is is because you and my probation officer and maybe even my therapist all want to you know, make sure I have the things that they say I need, and, and that's fine, but what about what I say I need? Well, that's and, where and communication comes in. Exactly. In order for you, for them to understand what your needs are, you still have to sit down and talk. Talking is a key process in all of this, because if you're continuously holding things in and feeling that you have a monopoly on the world and you can basically do it all on your own and you come up against a brick wall, it's going to lead to failure, so then it's going to disappoint you and maybe lead you to doing something you don't really want to do. So if you establish that communication between community, your you know, officer, not so much a supervisor, an overseer, but a mentor, someone who is like a teacher, because this is a new beginning for you. So you need to have certain understanding as to you have to take baby steps. You're going to crawl because eventually you're going to get up and walk. And you're going to walk away from all of this. But you're going to walk away in a positive way that you can look behind you and say, this is where I was, this is where I am, and this is where I'm going. And, and, and I understand briefly, that. Raymond. Once, well, briefly, I understand that. But now you're talking about trust. That's, that's what you're talking about. And you're asking me to see this man as a resource in a system that, in my mind, has never been either for me. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ways that I, will help me trust or, or see him as a resource 
is if I understood from the beginning that he understood something about what I thought I needed, what okay. I thought I wanted, if that could be the, the opening conversation, what is it that you think you need? What is it that you think you want? That kind of opening conversation allows me to think of myself as not only the center to be held back, but the center to be pushed forward. So I'm almost, by gun point, have to participate. I have to get involved because you, we're talking about what you said you wanted. And that's what would, may make me become, see him as a resource, somebody I can trust to do this and do this, and then the relationship might, might build. And, and, I'm, and, I, and I want, I'm encouraged that we're getting there simply by his response to the more complicated situations when he say it is both a benefit. When, 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 when I can see that he sees that my complexity as a benefit, then I'm encouraged. All right. Well, let's say we're there. All right. All right. <laughs> let's say we're there. But let's say, and things have been going very well under supervision, but things have been getting difficult in your life. You know, you got a lot to handle. You're a single parent. You got to try to hold down a job. Pressure's getting to you, okay? You miss an appointment. Community-based organizations. <laughs> Community-based organizations. We're not going there. <laughs> <laughs> We're running out of time, Cleopatra. <laughs> All right. You miss an appointment. Officer Taylor, how are you going to handle that? You're going to bring the judge in at that point? Uh, let's talk about that, and then I want to talk with Judge Blake very briefly. We've only got a couple minutes left. Let her rip. A uh, big part of our responsibility is decision-making. Uh, as, as a federal probation officer, uh, we've got a, a great deal of discretion. And as a professional, it, it requires me to, to analyze the situation and make a decision in terms of to what extent I get the judge involved. In this particular situation, it doesn't sound like uh, the facts support me moving forward with some type of recommendation for sanctions. That's something that I feel comfortable in handling um, in-house, and, and I will respond to that particular situation accordingly. Judge Blake, that sound reasonable to you? Absolutely. Okay. There, I would expect a gradual progression. I would expect the supervising officer to have his eye on what's happening, um, make some independent judgments, always be balancing what do I do to promote the offender's well-being, reintegration into the community, long-term change against protection of the community. And if there's a real problem, then I want to hear about it. But I'd like to know that you've tried alternatives first. And if you have to come into court, you've got some suggestions for me because I'm relying on you. Very good. Panelists? I'd like to thank you so much uh, for this uh, conversation and this dialogue. It's just the beginning. I know we didn't get to a lot of the issues that we wanted to get to, but hopefully, maybe at some point in the future, we'll be able to reconvene. Uh, I want to also thank our audience. Thank you out in the field, and certainly thank our studio audience for joining us this afternoon. Um, we hope the program ha will be able to spur some dialogue in your districts about uh, the meaning of professional responsibility, particularly how professional responsibility relates to the attributes, goals, and values articulated in the Charter for Excellence. If there's anything more at the Federal Judicial Center that we can do to help you do that, please don't hesitate to contact us. In the meantime, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you later. <laughs>